Hello, my name is Warren Hall and I'm the National Manager of Support Services at the American Liver Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to today's program, the title of which is Cysts, Tumors and Lesions, a program brought to you by the American Liver Foundation. We're very happy about today's program. Uh, the ALF helpline and many of our social media platforms receive many questions about today's topic. The questions that I'll be posing uh, to today's guest were taken directly from those inquiries. If you have any additional questions today, please post them in the chat section and we'll do our best to respond to them. Our expert today is Dr. Gabriel Schnickel. Dr. Schnickel is professor of surgery in the Division of Transplant and Hepatobiliary Surgery at the University of California, San Diego. He obtained his medical degree from the University of Colorado and a Master's of Public Health at the University of Michigan. And I just want to give a shout out to those uh, in public health. <laughs> uh, he's a board certified in general surgery and ASTS certified in abdominal transplant surgery. Dr. Schnickel completed his surgery residence and abdominal transplant fellowship at UCLA at, under the mentorship of Dr. Ronald Basuti. In 2017, Dr. Schnickel joined the faculty of the University of California, San Diego as surgical director of liver transplantation in the Department of Surgery. Dr. Schnickel also serves on the National Medical Advisory Board for our own American Liver Foundation, the National Liver Review Board for UNOS, and the Medical Advisory Committee for Life Sharing. Dr. Schnickel's research interests focus on outcomes and process improvement in transplantation and liver cancer. So Dr. Schnickel, thank you very much uh, for joining with us today. Um, you know, I, I always say that having physicians who are also teachers uh, is a big plus for our Ask the Expert series uh, because you're used to getting information across in, in very methodic and understandable ways. Uh, so uh, today, however, uh, we're going to turn the tables on you. <laughs> so I'll be asking you the questions that we receive at the ALF uh, from people who have discovered through some testing, sometimes by accident, uh, that they have something in or on their liver. And of course, that's concerning uh, for many reasons. So once again, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, Warren. I'm glad to be here and hope I can help. Okay, yes, for sure. Okay, so I'm just gonna go uh, right to the list of questions here. Um, so the first uh, question that we have is, my doctor said I have complex cysts. I'm worried that this means cancer. Okay, Warren. So first of all, um, when we think of cysts within the liver, uh, they're usually categorized as simple or complex. And the complex term refers to the characteristics we see on an imaging study, such as an ultrasound or a CAT scan or an MRI. The complexity refers usually to um, characteristics that um, make it look more uh, you know, a cyst is usually kind of like a, a bubble within the liver filled with fluid. And you can think of a complex cyst as being like uh, more than one bubble uh, or a bubble that has uh, characteristics within it, like septations or, or debris inside of it. And the vast majority of cysts are not cancerous and have no chance of becoming cancerous. When they use the term complex, however, that means it should, it does warrant some further investigation. So that should uh, be a cue to talk to your doctor about uh, seeing either a specialist or having further imaging studies done. And usually it can be clarified with just uh, additional studies like a CAT scan or an MRI, and then a conversation with an expert. But the, 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 uh, Far and away, the chances are that, again, it's a benign lesion, meaning it is not cancerous and has no risk of becoming cancerous. Great. Sometimes it just plays on people's minds that they know there's something there. Uh, and of course, people want it out or whatever, but it's not necessarily um, what's needed. 
Exactly. But the term complex does warrant a little bit of further investigating and perhaps seeing an expert in liver disease. Great. Thank you. Um, is polycystic liver disease the same as having liver cysts? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, Warren. So polycystic just means you put the two words together, poly and cystic. So it means more than one and it means cysts. So there is a, uh, a disease of the liver called polycystic liver disease uh, in which the liver is almost replaced by innumerable cysts throughout the liver. Mm -hmm. um, people who have polycystic liver disease should be followed by a liver specialist. Just because you have a cyst in the liver or more than one cyst does not mean you have polycystic liver disease. It just wow. means you have cysts within the liver. Um, so the term polycystic, again, refers to a specific uh, um, a disease of the liver, uh, which, you know, does warrant being followed by a liver specialist. It uh, does not, again, does not mean you have cancer, does not mean that you need to have a liver transplant. It just means you have a, uh, um, you know, an issue with your liver and that the liver tends to form lots of cysts. So, and there are different levels of polycystic liver disease from a very uh, inert uh, course uh, to some people that have, you know, a growing liver uh, filling up with cysts over time. But usually the time frame for this disease is decades, not months, weeks, or even years. Okay. Um uh, another question is, uh, is a three centimeter cyst considered large? And I know we're, we're used to in our, I guess in America, right? We talk inches and, and once we get smaller than that, now we're confused. So is a three centimeter cyst, is that considered large? No, that would not be considered large. Uh, if we think about a three centimeters, that's, uh, you know, just over an inch. Um, we think of the liver, the liver is the largest solid organ in the body and it can be you know, 20 centimeters in diameter is not uncommon and, and uh, uh, you know, 15 to 20 centimeters in depth. So a three centimeters is really small and a three centimeter cyst would be nothing to worry about and is certainly not considered large. Great. Um, and uh, what are the long-term implications, if any, of liver cysts? So uh, the vast majority of cysts within the liver, and again, liver cysts are not that uncommon. Uh, we see them incidentally uh, picked up when people come to uh, see their doctor for you know, some abdominal complaints, or perhaps they go to the emergency room complaining of abdominal pain. They get an ultrasound or a CAT scan, and the, the, uh, the reading of that imaging study, the ultrasound or CAT scan, notes a cyst within the liver. So we see that quite commonly in the vast majority cause no symptoms, are not a problem, and really require no additional follow-up. There are occasions where cysts become large enough that they start pushing on the other organs within the abdomen. So the stomach or the small bowel, um, and then they can cause some symptoms. But the far and away, the vast majority cause no symptoms. Okay. okay, so now we're gonna switch uh, over to lesions now. Um, I have three tiny hyperechoic lesions. What does that mean? Sure, so um, doctors love to use the term lesions, which can be quite confusing because we use a lot of terms that kind of overlap and are interchangeable. So a lesion is a very generic term used by doctors to uh, reference a finding within an organ, within, so in this case, within the liver. We can use that term lesions to uh, describe a cyst, to describe a tumor, to describe, um, uh, you know, something that is mm, unusual within the liver or something that we commonly see, but it can, it has an overlapping, uh, uh, it's an overlapping term with other, other uh, terminology. It's just generic to encompass all these things we see. So second of all, 
hyperechoic. If we break it down, uh, hyper means you know high, a lot of. Echoic means echoing. Uh, and so in an ultrasound, an ultrasound you know delivers sound waves through tissues and then reads those sound waves as they bounce back. So hyperechoic means there's a lot of uh, sound waves bouncing back, and in an ultrasound it looks bright as opposed to hypo, which means less than, uh, echoic, which means dark, a dark lesion on the liver. So those two, th that term hyperechoic just means a bright lesion noted on a CAT scan. And that can be a number of things. It can be a, um, a benign tumor of the liver. Um, usually the tininess of it is, is uh, probably nothing to worry about, but a hyperechoic lesion within the liver might warrant getting another study like a, a CAT scan or an MRI that can better characterize that spot in the liver. Again, lesion just refers to a spot seen in an organ, in this case, the liver. So hyperechoic, bright on ultrasound, lesion just means a spot in the liver. Okay. Um, here's a, a question that we've had somewhat in various ways. Um, I have had breast cancer. So I'm going to presume that the person asking this either has been cured of that or whatever. So um, I've had breast cancer and now I'm told I have a liver lesion. Um, could this be that the cancer has spread? Okay. So thanks, Warren. So again, we get back to this term lesion, which again, we just talked about is kind yeah. of a generic term. Right. that uh, can uh, refer to uh, a lot of different, uh, you know, findings within the liver. So again, breast cancer can show up in the liver. It's quite rare and unusual, but it can happen. Um, it, but the odds, the, the far and away, the odds are this is not associated with the breast cancer. But again, if you have a lesion, the lesion within the liver, and there is a history of breast cancer, depending on the characteristics of the, this lesion, so what, are the, what does the study say? Is it hyperechoic? Is it hypoechoic? Does it look like a cyst? It may warrant additional imaging. Yeah. In, in the vast majority of cases, this imaging, like a CAT scan or an MRI, can characterize and determine what that lesion is within the liver. So different lesions have different characteristics on CAT scan and on MRI that allow us to determine with a high level of confidence what that lesion is. And, and I guess it's not uh, uncommon and maybe it's good for a person who has had a history of cancer to be aware of anything because um, it, you know, the, of course, the thought always will be, is it coming back? And that's a good question to ask, right? So, Absolutely. And yeah. I would assume, just as you, that, uh, you know, I would hope this person is followed regularly by uh, their doctor, uh, whether it's the oncologist or their general practitioner, you know, since they have that history of breast cancer, and they're followed closely, you know, uh, to make sure that they don't have any uh, recurrence of their disease. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So now we'll, we'll get into a question about tumors. Um, are there different types of tumors and are all dangerous? Yeah, that's a good question, Warren. So there are lots of different types of tumors uh, that occur within the liver and we break them down into benign or non-cancerous and malignant or cancerous. Okay. There are a lot of benign tumors of the liver. So, and, and they're not that uncommon. Uh, we see them more in women than in men. Um, and some of those benign tumors of the liver include, uh, we call it an adenoma. Um, and um, in the vast majority of cases, there's nothing to do about that. It doesn't need any, any uh, uh, treatment. There's called what's called Focal nodular hyperplasia, which is a mouthful of words. We call it FNH because we like acronyms in, in medicine. Uh, also something that doesn't need any, any treatment and is a benign lesion. Those two lesions 
again, I'm using the term lesions. Those two type of benign tumors I have don't have really as a risk of, of becoming cancer. And we see them uh, uh, quite frequently, at least in my practice, because we get referrals for people who, again, show up, have, uh, uh, you know, a, and a workup from their doctor that they get an ultrasound or a CAT scan that shows, a, you know, something within the liver. And again, the, most of the time, this is not cancer. Um, and it's, it's not uncommon to see non-cancerous tumors in the liver. Okay. And to, to uh, move on to the cancerous lesions, you know, obviously there are a lot of cancers that can show up in the liver. And uh, the most common is what we call uh, 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 metastatic disease or cancer that spreads from somewhere else like colon cancer, uh, most commonly that can spread from the colon into the liver. Um, usually we, we don't see these as a primary, you know, usually those, those people have a history of, of cancer. And then we see the, the, uh, uh, metastases show up later. Um, but it can, they can occur at the same time. There's also primary liver cancer, um, such as hepatocellular carcinoma, another mouthful, uh, we call it HCC for short. Uh, that is a primary liver cancer that is associated with uh, most commonly in patients who have cirrhosis. So patients who have some advanced liver disease are more prone to develop uh, uh, liver cancer. Okay. Um, are there um, the, um, when it comes to the, uh, each of these, is it possible to have more than one uh, can a person have uh, lesions and tumors or cysts and lesions? Is, is that possible? Sure. Uh, what I've uh, learned in, in medicine, uh, Warren, is that just about anything is possible. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It is not, uh, it's not uncommon for us to see uh, more than one thing going on in the liver, more than one, you know, lesion, uh, more than one type. So someone can have a cyst in their liver and also have one of these benign tumors of the liver, adenoma or FNH. Or if someone who has a cyst in the liver that has been there for you know, years and years um, can develop cancer in the liver. So we might see a cyst and a cancer in the liver. So yes, uh, more than one thing can be happening in the liver uh, at one time. Okay. Um, what further testing uh, and uh, specifically biopsy has come up with this? Do, do all these things need to have a biopsy? Yeah, that's a really good question, Warren. And the answer is no. Uh, again, in the modern era, the imaging uh, of the liver is so good that in the majority of cases, we're able to make the diagnosis just on the imaging alone. And usually that imaging is going to be a CAT scan with contrast, uh, meaning there's uh, contrast given intravenously with through your veins, or an MRI with contrast, again, through the veins. Those two um, tests are very good at um, telling us or providing the information where we can make the diagnosis. Um, mm -hmm. Because each of these types of liver uh, findings, these liver lesions, has a unique characteristic, like a signature that we see uh, on the CAT scan or the MRI. Now, obviously, just like anything in medicine, these, it's not 100%, and sometimes we do need to do a biopsy to get a diagnosis. And usually, we do this when something looks a little bit more suspicious and doesn't have the perfect characteristics that we look for to, to provide us with an absolute answer on imaging alone. So it's the vast majority of the time we don't need a biopsy, but sometimes, sometimes we do. Um, and uh, to provide us with a little bit more certainty. And if it is cancer, we may need it in some cases to help us to determine what the best course of treatment would be. Uh, but would you say that these days, generally speaking, biopsy is not the go-to uh, procedure to do, right? Because of the invasiveness of it? Yeah, I would say that's true. Um, that again, the, the majority of the time we're able to make the diagnosis with imaging uh, alone. So with a CAT scan or an MRI, 
alone. Uh, but when we do need to do a biopsy, it, because it is a little bit more invasive, obviously, usually you're going through the abdominal wall to get to the liver. Um, uh, that being said, a biopsy is very safe. Um, and again, with the uh, techniques and with uh, modern medicine, a uh, biopsy can be done, uh, you know, usually pretty easily and, and very safely. Okay. Um, so what, uh, what are the symptoms that might be associated with any of these, with the cyst tumors or lesions? Like, is there a way, because as I mentioned, the intro is very often these are found, quote unquote, by accident. Right. Um, but uh, is there something people should look out for? Or is there something that um, could uh, trigger in their mind that, well, this is what it might be? Or are there not? Right. A great question, Warren. And uh, at least in my practice, you know, what we see quite frequently is, you know, someone goes to see their doctor for, you know, uh, some abdominal complaint. So perhaps they're having bad reflux or they're having a lot of pain and they go to their doctor, they go to the emergency room that prompts a, an ultrasound or a CAT scan, which finds this, you know, uh, we call them incidentalomas, meaning that they are found incidentally right? And the pain resolves or the symptoms that the patient result, you know, they go away on their own and are unrelated to the findings in the liver, okay? So most, most lesions, most tumors, most cysts, all of those things, benign or malignant, don't tend to cause symptoms uh, in the liver um, or in the abdomen. So, it's unusual that that uh, what we find is actually related to the symptoms. So uh, again, the symptoms are uh, unrelated and resolve on their own, and we're left with these findings in the liver. Um, uh, and again, usually benign findings. Um, uh, tumors within the malignant or cancerous tumors within the liver also generally don't tend to uh, uh, present with symptoms either, which Right. is, you know, makes it a little bit difficult and, and uh, uh, it's unfortunate that we don't find them until later. Right. Uh, so I just learned a new word, incidentalomas, right? Yeah. Is that what the word? Incidental. That's, that's, yeah, that's a word. I don't know that you'll find that in the dictionary, Warren, but okay. uh, it's common uh, uh, medical ease uh, that we yeah. use. Uh, the idea being that the this spot in the liver, this lesion is found incidentally and right. unrelated to the presenting symptoms that the patient had. And yeah. those symptoms will frequently go away. All that being said, Warren, it, um, you know, some, some uh, lesions in the liver do cause symptoms. And the two ways that they usually do are um, from pushing on other things. So a cyst, once a cyst gets big enough, it can push on the stomach and cause people to feel like they get full really quickly. Uh, right. They can't eat as much as they could. Um, also, you can get um, uh, something pushing on the, uh, what we call the biliary tree of the liver. Uh, the liver, one of the jobs, the liver has over 500 jobs. It does, it's, a, it's an amazing organ. But one of its jobs is to synthesize and process and excrete bile. Uh, and bile gets excreted into our intestines and helps us to digest fat. And so you can think of the, the bile ducts within the liver as kind of like uh, the small branches of a tree that come together to eventually form a common trunk, okay? That common trunk the, called the common bile duct empties into our small intestine and helps us to digest fat. So sometimes a, a lesion in the liver, a tumor in the liver can push on that bile duct and cause it to back up, kind of like a clogged drain. And that person uh, can present with what we call jaundice, where perhaps their eyes turn yellow, their urine gets very dark. Uh, sometimes if it progresses enough, their skin starts to turn yellow. Um, so those are uh, the some of the symptoms that might show up in someone who has a uh, uh, a liver uh, lesion or something within the liver. Okay. 
Yeah, and that's true of many liver issues, as you mentioned. You know, that's why we tell, talk to people about screening. You know, a screening means you go look for something because especially with the liver, because the, the liver is not uh, an alarmist, so to speak. It's not always gonna let us know when something's going on. And, yeah. um, and we don't want people to be surprised, especially by something serious. Yeah, that's yeah. a great point, Warren. And I think it's especially important for people who know they have some intrinsic liver disease. So mm -hmm. patients who have um, uh, hepatitis, either hepatitis B or hepatitis C, even if it's been, the hepatitis C has been cured, those folks really can need to continue to have screening because they're at risk for developing a, a primary liver cancer. And the same is true for patients who have hepatitis B, even if they're on medicine for that and they have no evidence of, of liver disease, that can still show up as a, as a liver cancer. So those patients need to be screened regularly, um, either by their general practitioner or by a, a liver specialist. And that's really important to keep in mind. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so our final two questions, uh, I think you might have touched on this a little bit, is um, at what point or what would determine if my cyst tumor lesion has to be surgically removed? Now, I think you mentioned the one there is that cause and discomfort. Right, exactly. When we think about cysts, um, uh, because that's a, you know something that is not uncommon in the liver, we think about treating cysts surgically uh, and surgery is really still the, the you know, definitive management uh, for these. And it, it can be done what we call minimally invasive with uh, uh, a laparoscopic approach, small incisions and video cameras. Um, so a cyst we consider treating when it starts to be sim either symptomatic. So it starts to push on things. Um, it gets large enough that people notice some, some uh, distension of their abdomen, some bloating discomfort. Um, again, we can sometimes it will push on the stomach or the small intestine and cause some, some difficulty with digestion. So that is well, one reason. The other reason, again, is if on imaging, it shows some uh, characteristics that are uh, uh, what we would term, uh, you know, concerning, um, that it's not a simple, straightforward cyst, that it has some uh, either some solid component or some, ab you know, some abnormal finding on the, on the imaging study that might warrant uh, a little bit closer look and more definitive management. Um, so that's when we think of treating cysts. Um, and then when we think of other tumors or lesions, there are some occasions where a benign tumor needs to be treated. Um, one would be if it's symptomatic. And the other would be based on size. Um, so in, in women who have a, what we call a hepatic adenoma, again, that's the benign tumor uh, of the liver, um, when it gets to be of a certain size, and that size is five centimeters or larger, um, we consider uh, the need for surgical resection or some other form of treatment because it does have a risk of bleeding uh, and that bleeding can be uh, significant. So size, of the tumor, um, if it's benign, symptoms, if it's a cyst, or characteristics on imaging, if it's a, a, a cyst. And then obviously any malignant tumor, meaning cancerous tumor that we see in the liver needs to be addressed. And this might be in the form of a surgical resection, or it may be uh, some other form of treatment that is less invasive, or it might need some systemic treatment like a chemotherapy or something like that. There's a lot of variations, Warren, really depending on what type it is, the size, the location. There's a lot of, a lot of variability there. Sure. Okay. Um, and finally, um, our final question, I'm rephrasing this a little bit, is um, what can I do uh, to avoid getting uh, any of these things. Uh, you know, sometimes people will contact us and say, I was told, you know, that I have liver cysts, what diet should I follow? Um, but, um, but this person is saying, is there something we can do to avoid um, a, a cysts or lesions to begin with? Yeah, uh, a great question and a question I also get in my practice a lot, Warren. Um, mm -hmm. Really, there is no special diet. I would advise uh, everyone that uh, you know, a heart healthy diet is gonna be the way to go. 
Um, you know, uh, we know that there is a, um, you know, increasing uh, incidence of uh, uh, fatty liver disease in, uh, you know, worldwide and, and particularly in the United States. So, uh, you know, addressing uh, obesity um, and metabolic syndrome with, you know, type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure is critically important. Um, uh, and then obviously alcohol is, is uh, contributing to the uh, more serious liver lesions. So we have to, you know, uh, drink in moderation or, you know, in discussion with your, with your physician, if you uh, should be drinking at all. Um, so, uh, but otherwise there's really nothing diet related that you can do to avoid uh, getting a liver lesion. Um, you know, liver health is, is critically important. And again, you know, with fatty liver disease, that's where we can really focus on that. And then, you know, uh, screening for hepatitis C is uh, uh, so critically important um, because it's something that we can cure now with the new direct acting antiviral medications that we all see on commercials. <laughs> uh, uh, but that's something that can prevent, you know, the development of liver cancer. And that's, that's where we might want to focus our efforts. Yeah, well, thanks so much. Uh, you, you know, at the Liver Foundation, we have many brochures about, you know, uh, things as common as fatty liver, but we also have on rare diseases. But we all feel that our most important piece of literature is liver wellness, because if you try do your best to follow that, you're not going to need any of those other ones. Uh, and so, although, as, as we said, you know, with so, certainly some liver cysts and tumors, I mean, that, that's a bit out of our control, but, but keeping our liver healthy overall um, is what the, the goal is. So yeah. I, I think that's, that's definitely the case. And, uh, you know, that's why, as we say that liver, liver health, uh, brochure, we want everybody to have. So, well, well doctor, th those are all the time we have today, uh, for the, the questions. I want to, um, thanks for your responses, uh, as I knew at the beginning, uh, understandable, methodical, um, and if I was your professor, I'd have to give you an A plus uh, for today. Uh, you know, I used to try to play stump the professor when I was in school and I couldn't do that uh, to you today. So uh, thank you very much. And we also wanna thank you for the work you do for the Liver Foundation. As I, I mentioned in your bio that you are a, a member of our uh, medical advisory group and we, we certainly uh, appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's it, uh, our listeners today, thank you for any additional information about today's topics, uh, as well as liver health in general, as we have been speaking about, um, you can visit our website, which is liverfoundation.org. Uh, you can contact our national helpline. We have a phone number, we have live chat, we have email, many ways to do that. Uh, you can connect with us on Facebook. We even have a few Facebook groups that might be of interest uh, for certain folks. Um, and then also along with this uh, presentation, uh, we do have educational videos on our YouTube channel. So you can go back over the, the years and months and see other educational uh, programming that we've had. So we thank you all for joining us today. And once again, doctor, uh, thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Warren. Okay.